reality for a long time. Mm -hmm. But for thousands of years, the real control of populations has been around their food. And we find ourselves in that same, you know, if not amped up version now mm -hmm. that we have 7 billion souls on the planet. That becomes very, very big business when you start to be able to control food. And we see that uh, the ultimate political control is around the food chain and whether it delivers health or not. I've basically found myself in a massively reductionist state of my understanding of the world around us when I had really spent, you know, 20 years of my life studying medicine, which was the opposite, where every year and minute you study in that environment, they try to convince you it's more and more complicated, that there's a thousand different diseases, that there's 10,000 different drugs to treat those diseases. Then. But in reality, what started to deconstruct that world was the realization that the cancer I was studying under the microscope when I was devising chemotherapy happened to be really the exact same process as an ulcer in the ankle of a diabetic patient. Again, sound totally disparate, but the end, totally reductionist viewpoint is it's only one thing, which is chronic inflammation. Inflammation is actually a, a normal biologic response to an injury. If we have a chronic inflammatory epidemic in the, in the world, which is a better definition than lots of diseases, then we must be overwhelming the immune system of all of the public for some reason at the same time. Mm -hmm. Sometime between 1982 and 2000, we had a, did something to the environment to totally decimate the protection system of our immunes, uh, immune systems. And the big tip-off to me in this process, you know, here I am in the labs developing chemotherapy and is so buried down the rabbit hole of the pharmaceutical model, but there was a big tip-off starting to happen in the late 1990s and early 2000s that we were seeing diseases in what seemed like completely different organ systems in the population go epidemic simultaneously. Examples of this was certainly autism that you mentioned earlier. We had 1 in 5,000 children with autism in 1975. Today we have, just three weeks ago, released the most recent data, 1 in 36 children with an autism spectrum disorder. And the big argument for a long time was, well, maybe we're just diagnosing and recognizing mm -hmm. autism better, which is kind of laughable if you've ever sat with an autistic child. Here's a five-year-old who can't speak, can't make eye contact, hits his head on the wall for a few hours a day to try to console his terror. We didn't miss that in 1975. Mm -hmm. You know, This is not a diagnostic dilemma. But then to further emphasize that, the fastest acceleration in that growth pattern of this epidemic has happened between 2012 and today, where we're seeing a doubling time every two to three years in that autism rate. At the current rate, we'll see one in three children with autism in 2035. And then in, in 1996, we saw this sudden rise in, uh, in the uh, Alzheimer's dementia in women. Interestingly, the Alzheimer's rates has not changed in males since that time. But at the same time, 1996, we see this uptick and consistent linear growth parallel to that Alzheimer's track in women with Parkinson's in males. And so we have you know, species-specific, gender-specific, organ-specific diseases in the brain and peripheral cancers, all of which took off at the same time mm -hmm. in the mid-1990s. Autoimmune disease. Oh, I mean, yeah unbelievable epidemic starting in the late 1990s. And so this was like the cracks that were starting to form in my worldview that maybe there weren't a thousand different diseases because they all started going epidemic at once, which really begged the question, is there a root cause of the root cause of the root cause of all disease? In the same way that we've misunderstood the gut and what gut health means, we, we misunderstood soil for the longest time. And in the 1900, early 1900s, really the late 1880s, we started to change the way we farmed. Um, simple things happened, like we went to steel grinding for wheat instead of stone grinding it, which meant we could get more of the fiber out of it, which means we created a higher gluten and a higher refined carbohydrate load in our flours and in our wheat system and everything else. So that's one example of a shift. But the main thing that happened is we started to disrespect the importance of crop rotation and soil rest, cover cropping, etc. This led to a massive death of the topsoil, which led to the Dust Bowl that ran through the 1920s and 30s. And it's fascinating that here we are only 80 years out from this event where our ancestors, you know, two generations, three generations, were literally starving to death. We had soup lines that went for days, you know, across the entire Midwest, and houses were literally being buried in, in dust of dead soil that had died. During the Dust Bowl, we actually, for the first time, started to outsource our food production because these people lost their local gardens and farms. Mm -hmm. So we started to rely on importing food for the first time, and we started to outsource that concept. 
Then World War II hit, and we did something interesting, which is we had this huge petroleum industry that was revved up bigger than it had ever been in the history because we had all tanks, jeeps, mechanized warfare for the first time in human history on this scale. We had planes for the first time. I mean, this was like mm. full out, totally different thing that had ever happened in history, and it was a, a world war, uh, much different than World War One in its scope. And so we see this huge petroleum industry that suddenly grinds to a halt because mm. the war is over. So we have this glut of petroleum, and we suddenly realize we can extract nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium out of that coal, that oil, and we started making chemical-based fertilizers for the first time. So they found a new marketplace for this oil, mm -hmm. and it was a great message to the farmers who were still suffering with bad dirt in the Midwest. Is like, you don't need to do crop rotation. You don't need to compost. You don't need to go back to thousands of years of farming right. tradition. Just spray this chemical on there. <laughs> yeah, forget about whatever you might have learned during right. the Dust Bowl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, that was that was 40 yeah, years ago. That's right. ancient times. We're modern now. <laughs> yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> and so these farmers started using it, and it became a revolution for them. And it was actually called the Green Revolution of the 1960s. The and so the Green Revolution was actually use of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or NPK fertilizers. And the NPK fertilizer did turn plants green because mm -hmm. nitrogen and phosphorus do that. But what was lacking in those plants for the first time in human history was the nutrients and the medicine that should always have been in that food. And so the plants became weak. Uh, just like a human being who lacks nutrients, their immune system goes down. And when a plant's immune system goes down, it becomes prone to viruses, pests, and it can't excrete the stuff from the root system that would keep weeds at bay. And so now the plants are getting you know, attacked from the outside, if you will, and the chemical, farmer, chemical industry says, no problem, here's a new chemical weed killer, here's a pe pesticide. And so the farmers got themselves locked into this codependent relationship with chemical fertilizers and chemical drugs for the plants to keep them alive despite a failing biology underneath the surface there right akin to taking a drug to deal with the symptoms of some ailment that you have that creates a whole battery of side effects that then require you to take another drug to deal with those it's just a an environmental version of that it's exactly the same thing and in fact the drugs have been the same in a lot of ways mm. the main drug is antibiotics uh, Western medicine really got its first foothold with penicillin, our first antibiotic, and that happened to be in the 1940s with World War II. And so we developed in the same decade the antibiotics that would kill the bacteria in our body with the antibiotics that would kill the soil. Mm -hmm. And I say antibiotic because these chemicals that we were using as pesticides are largely uh, an, uh, antibiotic rather than you know, what you would think of maybe a weed killer or something. And the most famous of these, of course, has become Roundup, the most single successful chemical warfare that's ever been sold on the planet. We currently uh, sell and use four and a half billion pounds of glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in the chemical, uh, to treat the soils of the earth. Four and a half billion pounds of a single chemical annually. That chemical was never patented as a weed killer. It's only been patented as an antibiotic and then it was repatented mm -hmm. as an antiparasite, antifungal. Wasn't, yeah, that was the original purpose of it, correct? Well, it's the mechanism. It's the mechanism they recognized. And so the re mechanism of glyphosate is to go in and block enzymes in soil bacteria, fungi, and plants. And that enzyme pathway is called the shikimate pathway. And it's, and it's important because it makes a number of the essential amino acids. Our bodies are composed of over 200,000 proteins but we only have 20,000 genes. We have this pathetically dumb genome in the sense that a flea has 30,000 genes. So you're two-thirds as complicated as a flea at the gene level, <laughs> which I find reassuring if I can't find my keys or yeah. I'm having a bad day. I'm like, hey, I'm two-thirds as complicated as a flea. Uh, what, can I, what are my real expectations here? But the reality is we're very simple at the genetic level, and yet we make over 200,000 proteins from a bunch of amino acids. There's 26 amino acids that will build those 200,000 proteins. Those 26 amino acids are just like the 26 letters of the English alphabet in the sense that the vast majority of those are, are useful but not critical. But the vowels, these eight vowels in our language, if you subtract one of those vowels, you can affect hundreds of thousands of words. The vowels in the amino acid uh, vocabulary here is, are the essential amino acids which if you start to tweak any of those nine, you're going to start to lose tens of thousands of protein structures in, in their functionality and in their, their unique form. And so those essential amino acids, not only are they important like the vowels, they also can't be made by the human body. So those nine have to come from your food chain somewhere. 
And it turns out that they are only made by the bacteria, the fungi, and the plants. You, can't, you don't have a shikimate pathway in your human cells. And so these essential amino acids are blocked through the shikimate pathway by Roundup. And so imagine treating a food chain with a chemical that blocks the ability of these plants to make the building blocks for a healthy human body. Mm -hmm. Forget about a human, it's a dog, a cat, any mammal, any complex multicellular biology is going to depend on these essential amino acids. And we literally, in the last 15 years, subtracted out the ability to build the body because we changed the, the 26 letters. And so the current statistics is that less than one-tenth of one percent of the Roundup used on the planet actually hits a weed. The other 99.99% gets into the soil and into the water it's system and water. washes off. And so we are now seeing the runoff from these farms and in the water table itself. So we have fossil aquifers in the United States here that run from Canada all, right, all the way down to, historically, Mexico, that is now dried up. We've, we've turned over 1,000 square miles of, of uh, Texas into desert over the, just the last 20 years from sucking water out of the ground. Mm -hmm. That fossil aquifer is now contaminated with Roundup that's filtered down into this ancient freshwater source for us. And then in the same moment, you've got the Mississippi River, which collects over 80% of all of the Roundup in the country, and then it's evaporating the whole time, so it's going into the air that you breathe, and then it goes into the clouds, and then it rains down on us. Recent studies in the air and rainfall in the southern United States is showing 75% of the rain, 75% of the air contaminated with Roundup. So before you even take a bite of That's food, insane. you're being hit with an antibiotic when you breathe. You're getting hit with an antibiotic when you, when you experience rainfall. And so you may be growing organic crops, but they're getting rained on. And so we have now locked this water-soluble toxin into our environment. Fortunately, you know, to give you a little bit of breather here from the bad news, is that there are bacteria and fungi that can eventually digest the glyphosate. The downside is we need to stop spraying it so that they can return. Mm -hmm. We're decimating those very bacteria and fungi by the presence of Roundup uh, to the point where they're not digesting it. Current estimates is if we stop spraying Roundup tomorrow, it would take about 50 years before our ecosystem saw a drop in the level of Roundup below our toxic years. level. If the conspiracy theorist was right, then we'd see one in two people with cancer, we'd see one in 30 kids with autism, we'd see Parkinson's going crazy. You know, they're literally repeating back, if, if, if it was toxic, we would see literally what we're seeing. You know? And so mm -hmm. the reality is the public health statistics have gotten so grim in the last eight years that nobody can call this a conspiracy theory anymore. Right. Um, but it's almost like, yeah, but that's, where's the direct, where's the smoking gun? The smoking right? gun is what's been missing. Mm -hmm. That's what we found in 2012. So in 2012, we found it backwards. Um, I don't think anybody's actually smart enough with the human gray matter that we're given to actually create a paradigm shift prospectively, right? So every great, you know, mind that we look to in past Galileo or, you know, Ben Franklin or anybody, we said, oh, they discovered something or, you know, Edison. These just came at moments when the evidence got so overwhelming that it became obvious, right? And so in the same way, in 2012, the evidence was getting so overwhelming that we were on to something in the nutrition world. But we, at the time, I was still thinking cancer, cancer therapy, because my background was in chemotherapy development. And so when I found these molecules in soil that looked similar to the chemotherapy I had been making, a lot of bells started ringing of like, what is that? Where did it come from? How is there medicine in the dirt? Like, what, where is that coming from? And within a few weeks of that discovery of those molecules, we found out that bacteria and fungi were making these specific shapes of these carbon molecules. And that really closed the loop for me because there had been some papers coming out in the mid-2000s in the cancer world that were starting to say that the bacteria in your gut were predicting which cancers you would get. If you were missing these bacteria, you would get prostate cancer. If you had these bacteria, you would get breast cancer. That was so radically bizarre and out there for our current model, even to this day, as to how cancer worked. But now you fast forward eight, ten years, and now there's tens of thousands of articles that are showing that genomically, mm -hmm. the bacterial genome is way more mm -hmm. important in determining cancer than the human genome. And, and so this reality was hitting. And so in 2012, when we discovered these chemicals that look a little like chemotherapy that are made by bacteria and fungi in the soil, 
it suddenly closed the loop of, oh my gosh, what if the bacteria in our gut is doing the same thing? What if the bacteria and the fungi are actually our best source of medicine Mm -hmm. for everything? Mm -hmm. And so that's the direction we were going. But as soon as we put this into Petri dishes with cancer cells and beyond, we suddenly realized, no, 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 there's something way deeper happening with these, this information stream coming out of bacteria and fungi. And it was my chief science officer, Dr. John Gilday, he's a PhD in genetics and, and, uh, uh, cell biology, and he uh, was the first to realize that we had put our finger on the glyphosate toxicity issue, is that this communication network from the bacteria and fungi was actually supporting the protein structure in our gut lining. And so it turns out that the gut is held together, these trillions of cells that make up that cellophane layer, by tight junctions. Mm -hmm. These are Velcro-like proteins that hold one microscopic cell to the next to create this coherent carpet. And he had recognized before this, in a number of other labs that started to publish, that glyphosate seemed to increase the permeability of this membrane. And nobody was really sure why yet. Um, But we suddenly realized that if this bacterial communication network was in there, we, we couldn't injure the, the membrane. We, it became bulletproof to the glyphosate injury. And so in that journey, we started to really study glyphosate and its relationship to the human cells. Because like you said, Monsanto has been swearing up and down that there is no harm to the human body because it, the shikimate pathway only exists in bacteria and fungi. Well, that may be true regarding that enzyme target, but the classic thing with any drug is it always has off-target effects, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's why drugs have side effects, is they don't actually go and do exactly what your doctor says it's going to go do. It's going to hit a bunch of other receptors and do other things. The side effects of glyphosate that are outside of the shikimate pathway is direct injury to the protein structure that holds your gut lining together. This would be bad news if that was it, but it turns out that every macro membrane in your body, the blood vessels that, that uh, fuel your entire body with oxygen and nutrients are held together with the same tight junctions. The blood-brain barrier that perfect, protects your peripheral nervous system and your brain, same tight junctions. The kidney tubules that are held together to, to detox your body, same tight junctions. And so what's happened as we've introduced a chemical that's directly toxic to this, this Velcro-like protein is we turn into leaky sieves on the front end, gut leak and nasal sinus leak. And so every time we breathe, every time we eat, we're starting to leak and our immune system gets overwhelmed. And then the blood vessels that are supposed to deliver either uh, an immune response from peripheral or get nutrients to some distant space is also leaking. And so we're getting permeability of the blood mm-hmm. vessels. Then you get to the blood-brain barrier. This is supposed to be the holy of holies. A peripheral nerve or the brain is supposed to be protected against everything in your blood. Because even glucose, which is the main fuel for your brain, should not get into the brain in an unregulated fashion. It will damage the nerves. And so the holy of holies of of the central and peripheral nervous system is being destroyed. And so if that's true, if glyphosate was really damaging that, then we should see a massive explosion in neurologic injury to children and adults starting in about 1996. And that's exactly when we see this steep increase happening in autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, neurodegenerative conditions like MS, autoimmune diseases, and all the rest. I mean, all of this has sounded like a lot of bad news, but identifying a problem is so much of the solution. Mm-hmm. You know? And so now that we identify the problem, look, we've, we've put into our food chain a chemical that deletes the ability to build a healthy human body. We've put into the food chain a chemical that deletes the medicine out of our food, which we didn't have time to talk about, but uh, that same shikimate pathway makes the alkaloids, which are the, the medicinal features of our food is deleted by glyphosate so we we build a diseased body we build a food chain that doesn't have the medicine in it and then we take away the most you know vital thing which is this microcosm macrocosm phenomenon you just talked about so far i've been describing to you that we are losing the identity between the outside world and our immune system by the breakdown of these membranes we get leak that's literally taking away self-identity from the immune system and so we get autoimmune disease where we're starting to react to our own body as if it was foreign in the same way at the macro level i believe we're losing our self-identity as human beings as we start to leak and we start to become majorly depressed panic disorder we start to get lost down these rabbit holes of doubt insecurity fear guilt we have spiritual crisis. We have relationship crisis that's on an epidemic level equal to, to cancer and beyond. Uh, the ability to stay in human relationship seems to be the most complicated thing that we could possibly endure right now. It's because we are literally losing self-identity at the cell level because we are eating a chemical that breaks our self-identity at the cell level. A sickness happens and it results in, in an immune reaction and a healing process. 
I think that's what's happening to our society right now. We have a sickness and a disease on the planet of loss of self-identity and human consciousness of our purpose here only to trigger the ultimate healing process, Mm -hmm. which is to realize that we're all one. We are all on one mission to find truth in ourselves and through one another. We are calling in community. We are going to overcome the isolation of our cell phone era. We're going to start to touch each other more. We're going to hug each other more because we have to. And that's a beautiful healing process that I already see afoot in the world around me. And I'm blessed to be able to go and speak all over the world right now. And I'm blessed in that journey to see humans changing their macro consciousness as they change their diet, as they change their nutrition, as they get in touch with their food chain, as they put bacterial and fungal communication networks back into their body. They come back 18 months later to my clinic and they'll say, Doc, I just left my husband. He's been abusing me for 35 years, and I finally realized I don't deserve that, Mm -hmm. and I left. And so the you know a woman can in an instant suddenly realize as her boundaries go up at the gut and at the blood-brain barrier, her macro boundaries of that's not spiritually and psychologically appropriate. I am me. I am. I am important. I am loved. I don't need that kind of abuse in my life. In the same way, I'll have somebody walk in and say, Doc, I just quit my job. I just started my company that I've been wanting to start for 30 years and wasn't confident enough to start. And I just realized I am ready and I just did it. And so I have this goosebump experience over and over again, despite some of the you know tragedy that's in the talks that I give and the science that I now know. And I'm constantly seeing this bubbling up of human hope and human healing and consciousness coming on. And I take great hope in that. I take great excitement that if a few of us can become conscious and aware and awake right now, it has a ripple effect that is so quick. And it has to be quick because one thing we can be certain with, no matter what background we come from scientifically or politically, we can agree that any society faced with one in three children with autism will collapse under a financial blow that is inescapable. And so we're about 16 years away from a sure, complete collapse of our financial status as a country and yet we don't hear a single politician talking about we don't because why because the politicians are not the solution you and i are the solution as consumers and we are doing it already the organic food movement nobody predicted how successful it was going to be 10 years ago it was less than one percent of the food sold in the country and now we're pushing it you know we're up to maybe four or five percent in a lot of communities if we can push that to 16 percent these are numbers that were apparently leaked from Monsanto. In their marketing analysis, if, if the American food chain became 16% organic, Monsanto and chemical farming would lose its financial stability. Thank you for watching this episode of After School. I'm Dr. Zach Bush and I'm just honored to be with the community. At the fabric of our nature is the message and capacity for regeneration. And fascinatingly, after the last five extinction events on the planet, there has been an explosion of life because in fact the fabric of the genome, the fabric of biology as it is made, is that of adaptation and diversification. After every major extinction event, the level of stress within the genome inspires more creativity. It is not a demise, it is not a victim, it sees the opportunity for something more dynamic, more adaptive, and more resilient, and ultimately more intelligent. After that last great extinction, the world did not suffer back or struggle back to create the dinosaurs. Instead, Mother Nature envisioned the possibility of birds, mammals, humans. And here we walk the earth today. And we have triggered an extinction event through our extraction and our consumption because of our our belief that we are separate from nature, that we need to control her, that we need to domineer her, and that we actually are some sort of manifest destiny towards her consumption. Changing that mindset and coming into alignment with Mother Nature will create a future that none of us can imagine. We could in fact be a part of that new adaptation of biology on Earth for a more intelligent, more diverse, and more explosively regenerative future. I look forward to being there with you.